This is our sixth and the last week of uh, the microbiomics seminar series. And uh, this week we're going to talk about phylogenomics. But uh, actually, the discussion will be led by uh, Mike Lee, who is with us right now on the call. Here, I would like to invite Mike to share his screen and uh, um, walk us through his lecture. And thank you very much for letting me be a part of this, Marin. We're going to start with talking about phylogenetics and phylogenomics, what they are, um, how we typically do them or practice them. Then we're going to discuss what single copy core genes are and why specifically those are so uh, useful uh, as targets in phylogenomics. And then we'll move into which genes to actually use and why there isn't one best set to use when we're talking about phylogenomics. So getting right into it, phylogenetics is the, the practice of trying to infer evolutionary relationships between organisms based on heritable traits or characteristics. And as Marin covered in his uh, really great introduction overview of microbial ecology in general in the week one seminar, this isn't limited to sequencing data, of course, and traditionally was done based on morphology, like how things looked. This figure is generally cited as being the first phylogenetic tree that tried to capture all organisms, all known organisms, of course, uh, published in a book by Ernst Haeckel in 1866. And it was in the same book that Haeckel actually introduced the term uh, phylogeny. But morphology, just how things look, wasn't as helpful, of course, when we got into microbial life. And it was Carl Woese who helped pioneer the use of molecular data in phylogenetics which allowed him to generate this tree here, prompting him to realize and then champion that it seems there are three distinct overall clades of life, and specifically that archaea and bacteria should be recognized as distinct. But regardless of how the trees are made, phylogenetic trees are just visual representations of these hypotheses about evolutionary relationships. It's certainly starting to change now, but many phylogenetic trees are just like this one made by Woese, uh, based on a single gene type. And here are the main conceptual components of, of how this is done. We would identify our target gene of interest and all of the genomes we want to look at. That would be like presented in blue in this little cartoon here. And we would then align these genes that we've pulled from each genome. And this is to allow us to compare them by sort of capturing all the information about the changes we think they've gone through in one table or one matrix. And then we would try to infer evolutionary relationships from that table and that matrix. And we do that using some sort of evolutionary model that tries to take into account that not all changes are equally likely to have occurred. But let's think about what it uh, means to make a tree from a single gene type. When we do this, when we generate a phylogenetic tree of a single gene, what we're doing is we're creating a hypothesis about the evolutionary relationships of those included genes, not the organisms they come from. What this means is if we are trying to think about the evolutionary relationships of the organisms those genes came from, what we're doing is using these genes as proxies to stand in for those organisms. And that means we are assuming that the evolutionary relationships of those genes tells us something meaningful about the relationships of the organisms they came from. That's a lot of responsibility for, for a gene. When Woese was thinking about this, he ended up championing the use of ribosomal RNA for this purpose, particularly when trying to look across all of life. And as we talk about what we might want in a gene for this purpose, we'll discuss what the ribosome is and why a strand of RNA that's part of it was useful. So what are some of the things we would want in a, in a gene that we're using to represent the evolutionary history of its source organism? For one, we'd want it to be present in all the organisms we're trying to compare. And the ribosome is essential for protein synthesis in all known bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, and essential in the biological sense where these things can't survive, they can't propagate without it functioning properly, without it being there. Another important thing is we want the gene to be highly constrained functionally in a similar way across all of the organisms that we're looking at. And what this means is the more consistently 
for why we want this. The more consistently and functionally constrained something is, the less susceptible it is to accruing different evolutionarily selected changes in different organisms. And we care about this because when we're trying to think about phylogeny at the organism level, ideally, we want to measure the background accumulation of random mutations, at least as much as possible. The ribosome is comprised of many proteins in addition to RNA, and all these things need to interact with each other in specific ways. And this ends up helping to functionally constrain each of these different proteins and the RNA that's in there, because a large change in one of these macromolecules might change how the whole unit operates together, and therefore the organism wouldn't be able to propagate possibly. So this is what made Wos use small subunit specifically ribosomal RNA. And in bacteria and archaea, this is called the 16S, which you may have heard of. And in eukarya, it's called the 18S. And sequencing this ribosomal RNA from many different organisms, and then going through this process laid out here is what made Wos realize the archaea should be considered their own distinct group. Now, at this level of resolution, trying to look across all domains, the phylogeny of a single gene like this, that's well suited for this purpose, is capable of revealing that type of information. But if we're trying to work at a higher level of resolution, like maybe trying to establish clear relationships or clear delineations between more closely related organisms, often just a single gene isn't sufficient to do that. And even as early as 1990, three years after that previous tree was made and published, working with only a few dozen organisms, Wost had run into a scenario where 16S genes alone were not enough to confidently resolve a bacterial relationship at the phylum level. What they were seeing were some alignments of these 16S sequences were supporting a common shared ancestor of two phenotypically diverse phyla, but other alignments of the same data were not supporting that relationship. And in this work, Wos et al. used the large subunit ribosomal RNA to further investigate this relationship. So at least as early as 1990, we were already using multi-gene information and in trying to learn about organism level phylogenies. This brings us to phylogenomics. Well, this is definitely under the umbrella term, under the category of phylogenetics. Phylogenomics is used more specifically to convey that we're trying to infer evolutionary relationships at something closer to the whole genome level rather than an individual gene phylogeny gets us. It's worth noting that this isn't the only way the term is used or even how it was originally introduced by Jonathan Eisen when he coined it in his 1998 paper. Uh, Jonathan was initially using it to describe a method of trying to better resolve predicted functional annotations by incorporating phylogenetic information. But by far the more common use today is how we're discussing it here. And so first we're gonna talk about the conceptual main components of the most common way currently to generate a phylogenomic tree. And then we'll talk more about how we select the genes that we're going to use. So similar to before, we're going to first identify the genes we want in all of the genomes we're considering. So here maybe we have genomes A, B, and C and we're looking for these three different colored genes in them. We would then align these individual target genes together separately. And then we stick all of them together, making a, a long sequence that's representing each genome in this case. And then again, we would try to infer evolutionary relationships. And as mentioned with the single gene tree, we do this with some sort of evolutionary model that's trying again to take into account that not all changes are equally likely. And that can be done across the whole sequence we've made, or it can be done specifically for each individual gene when working with a long concatenated sequence like this. But just like we thought about what making a tree of a single gene means, let's think the same thing about this concatenated sequence we've just made. Just like with a single gene tree, where we're making a hypothesis about the relationships of those genes we've included, not directly the organisms they've come from, we're doing the same thing here with a, a multiple gene tree. We're attempting to infer the evolutionary relationships of these sequences we just made. And so the same principles apply. If we're trying to think about the evolutionary relationships of the organisms these came from, which we usually are in this case, 
we're using these sequences as proxies standing in for the organisms. And that means that we're assuming the relationships of these sequences, again, tell us something meaningful about the organisms and how they relate. So like before, we have similar guiding principles to help us feel like that assumption is at least uh, reasonable. And this brings us to the concept of single copy core genes and why they are so important in, in when we're doing phylogenomics. So single copy core genes, which are also called just single copy genes, these are genes that are present in exactly one copy in all or most of the organisms we are focusing on. Um, just like we mentioned when making a single gene tree, to compare across organisms, ideally we want the gene to be present in all things we're considering. And this is true in considering genes used for phylogenomics. This is where the core part comes from in single copy core genes. And as we heard Marin discuss during the pangenomics seminar, core typically refers to the genes that are present in at least one copy in all of the organisms we're looking at. And we're talking about the same exact thing here. Also, we want the genes we are going to use for phylogenomics, just like single gene trees, to be functionally constrained as much as possible. And this is where wanting a single copy um, specifically comes into play. We want genes that are present in a single copy. And this is because when genes duplicate within a genome and multiple copies exist, it becomes more likely that they may be, one of them may be evolving under different selective pressures now. And this would confound our attempts to try to understand evolutionary relationships that are at the organism level. The genes that we, we want are called orthologs. And we're gonna break this down a little bit because it's kind of important for this. Orthologs are versions of the same gene type in different organisms that have only diverged along with those organisms. And this is definitely one of those things that's much easier to see visually than explain with words. So we're going to walk through a, a cartoon of it. You start off with one organism, and here we are highlighting one gene type within it. And here it's just shown as this gray rectangle. We can imagine through time, this organism is propagating. And along with its lineage, our, our gray gene is also propagating. At some point, we may decide that this initial organism has diverged enough such that we would consider two of its descendants as different organisms. And this could be at any level. Maybe we'd call them different species. Um, as they continue to propagate after this, they're each passing along a copy of our grade gene. And if we were to pull these genes out of these organisms, these would be considered orthologs because they, their genes, those genes share one common gene ancestor. And this is in contrast to paralogs, which are the things we want to avoid. So paralogs are the result of a gene duplication event. And those are the ones that are more likely to possibly be evolving under different evolutionary pressures, which we want to avoid. Again, much easier to see with a cartoon than with uh, words. So we start off again with one organism, same gray gene we're highlighting within it. Only this time, our gene undergoes a duplication event within a single genome, such that this organism now has two copies of this gene. As more time passes, there is already one gray gene performing the traditional function of the gray gene. It's not unusual for its copy to begin to diverge in sequence and in functionality, here represented by the, the darker gray with the line going through it. Separate from that gene divergence, at some point, again, if these or this organism diverges far enough that we call it something else, it's different enough to us that we're now looking at both of them. Each now is continuing to propagate, passing along their two copies of this gene, though possibly under different selective pressures now. Now with perfect information, we would be able to distinguish between these two gene types and grouping the light gray with the light gray, those would still be orthologs. Or the dark gray with the dark gray, those would still be safe orthologs. But the light gray with the dark gray, these are now paralogs because they don't share the same most recent common ancestor uh, in a gene sense, I mean. We may not be able to, to distinguish them though based on sequence similarity or the typical search method we use to find these genes. 
So to further drive home why this is detrimental when we're trying to think about organism level phylogenies, we're gonna take this example a little bit further. And if we start with our two diverged organisms and their gene copies, we imagine further through time, they diverge into three distinct organisms each. Three that came from the blue type and three that came from the red orange type. Here we can say we know the true phylogeny because we're, we're making it up. And we know these three blue are descendants of the same most recent common ancestor, which is the blue pill. And the three red orange ones are descendants of the same most recent red orange pill. Should have picked a color I could say more uh, easily. <laughs> but if we try to use these genes to, again, remember, despite the colors here, we might not be able to distinguish the difference between uh, the different types we have. We might just see that there are two copies of the same gene type we searched for. If we randomly picked one of these copies and tried to infer evolutionary relationships, we might see something like this. Now, it's important to think if we were trying to think about the gene level divergence here, the gene level phylogeny, this would be informative because it shows us this gene type seems to have diverged into two different clades. The light grays are grouped together and the dark grays are grouped together. But if we were trying to think about the organism level phylogeny, this would uh, mislead us here because based on the organisms these come from, well, what we would think if we didn't know the real phylogeny is that maybe the square and the circle share the same most recent common ancestor separately from the rest of them. And those all share their own most recent common ancestor. But knowing the truth in this case, we're actually seeing relationships of the gene that are not representative about the evolution of the organisms they came from. So this is why we stick to single copy genes. Uh, they're certainly not perfect, and they can still be susceptible to things like horizontal gene transfer, which is also, of course, confounds our signal when we're trying to think at the organism level. But using single copy orthologs like this uh, helps protect us a lot from issues that paralogs cause. And this is why we hear the term single copy gene so much when it comes to doing phylogenomics. So that covers more broadly what type of genes are generally useful for this. But we also want to cover why there isn't any single best set. And this is just because the organisms we're considering are what dictate the genes that should be used, uh, both in terms of what's possible to use and in terms of what will give us the most resolution on those specific organisms. So following what we just talked about, why single copy genes are so important, the amount of genes that are actually going to meet these criteria will, of course, vary depend on what we're looking at. And if we're focusing on a very broad level of diversity, it will be a relatively smaller amount of single copy genes. But if we're focusing on a very narrow level of diversity, we're going to have a greater amount of those. And just to put some rough uh, numbers as examples for general context, if we were focusing on all three domains, we might have something like 15 genes that will work for this purpose across all domains of life. Uh, if we narrowed our focus to maybe one domain, we might have something like 70 suitable candidates or maybe 100. There's still room in how we're defining uh, what is a, a, an appropriate single copy gene. If we narrowed our focus further and we just looked at one phylum, with cyanobacteria in particular, there's probably around 250 that are suitable. And narrowing even further, if we look at one part of a genus, like just the marine synecococcus, which are a type of cyanobacteria, we might have as many as a thousand genes that are useful for this. And these organisms in particular are kind of small. I think they have around 2,500 or 3,000 genes. So as we narrow our focus, we can really increase our resolution a lot uh, in trying to resolve those relationships. And it's also, I just want to note, these rough numbers are specific to that taxa, not necessarily the rank. So when I say cyanobacteria, you might have around 250. That's not true for phylum in general. Uh, a different phylum will have totally different case because microbial diversity is crazy. But depending on what our purpose is and the span of organisms we are considering, we might just want to use a previously generated set of genes and that are suitable for that clade. So again, if we're looking at across all bacteria, lots of people have already put together 
single copy gene sets for bacteria that will work very well for that purpose. But there will also be times we want to identify our own single copy genes that are highly specific to the organisms that we care about and will provide the maximum amount of resolution for what we are looking at. And I think in a I think that's part of what Marin's going to tie together for us, that we would often do this with pangenomics. So summarizing, it's also worth explicitly stating here that there's no special cutoff for when phylogenetics becomes phylogenomics. It's really just as fluid as I've defined it here, uh, that phylogenomics, phylogenomics is something closer to a genome level than an individual gene level phylogeny. And some people don't even use the term and that's fine too. Uh, these are all just phylogenetic trees in the end. I personally find it useful to explicitly convey that we are trying to think about the organism level phylogeny by using some concatenated representation of the genome. And just rehitting some of those main points, uh, a molecular phylogenetic tree is a hypothesis about the included sequences and not directly the organisms we come from. We are making some assumptions to do that. And that's one of those things that is obvious at the surface, but it's easy to forget when we start looking at things, and it helps to keep that in mind. And why single copy core genes? We want things to be present across everything, so that's at least being present once. And then we want things to be highly constrained functionally, and we're much safer in pursuing that with things that are in single copy rather than working with things that have multiple copies. And why is there no one best set of single copy genes to use? And this is just because the organisms we're considering are what determine the most appropriate genes to utilize and what will give us the best resolution that we can get based on the diversity we are trying to span and look at. And with that, I'll just say thanks and pass it back to you, Marin. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, this is where we essentially left. And um, what I wanted to do uh, is a quick comparison of um, uh, various strategies, a, a quick and practical comparison of various strategies to infer association between genomes. Now, you heard about phylogenetics. Um, you heard about phylogenomics. Uh, you heard about pangenomics, uh, combining this week's content and previous contents. So how do they link to each other is, I think, uh, a worthy uh, uh, discussion that, that can help us to understand how we can best utilize these approaches. But also through these discussions, sometimes one uh, realizes more about a single approach. So how do these different strategies compare uh, to each other in practice? Is that a very easy question to answer? So I try to summarize how these methods compare to one another using this plane where we're looking at the evolutionary distance between genomes we're trying to compare and the fraction of genome used by these approaches uh, when we try to do that. For instance, uh, phylogenetics is uh, often relies upon a single gene or a few genes uh, uh, historically. And uh, regardless of the evolutionary distance of genomes you're studying, uh, if these genes are present, if you're looking at uh, relatively conserved genes like ribosomal RNAs, you end up using a very small fraction of the gene regardless of the evolutionary distance. And phylogenetics becomes kind of uh, irrelevant when you are at the realm of very closely re related organisms because uh, the amount of variants those individual genes accumulate may not have uh, given you enough signal to discern organisms that are only just recently diverged from each other. So um, in this kind of thinking, phylogenomics represents uh, a little uh, broader because uh, as the evolutionary distance between organisms you are trying to compare decreases, you have a selection of from a very small number of genes uh, uh, that represent a very small fraction of the genome uh, to a very large fraction of the genome, like the example might give. If, you have, uh, if you're looking at cyanobacteria, uh, the core genes in cyanobacteria will be uh, uh, for instance, he, here, an entire phylum, if you're wor uh, working with um, Pseudomonas, uh, a, a single species in Pseudomonas, for instance, that you will be able to use a very large fraction of the genome if you wanted to. You can, because single copy core genes, if they are the basis of phylogenomics, then 
you will find lots of single copy core genes when you look at those genomes that are very close rated. So as evolution distance uh, across genomes we're comparing uh, goes down, the number of genes we can use as single copy core genes dramatically increases. So we have a broad selection. And when we try to compare things that are very distant from each other, for instance, multiple different phyla, the number of genes we can rely upon uh, uh, goes down and down. And actually it becomes 15, let's say. Uh, uh, I guess Mike mentioned that there are about 15 uh, genes that are conserved throughout the entire life, except viruses uh, and so on. And uh, pangenomics in reality uh, gives you inferences uh, uh, based on the entire gene pool as well, as we discussed. In that case, we are not relying on core genes and we are not relying on singletons, but we are re relying on accessory genes in pangenomes uh, uh, we have generated from any set of genomes uh, uh, we were interested. So it kind of looks like this. I think I thought a little about this and then I came up with the shape. Maybe it's not fully accurate, but just to communicate the idea, um, uh, since we are looking at accessory genes in pan genomes, among very close rate taxa, accessory genes are going to be a small fraction of the genome because the large fraction of the genome is going to be uh, the core genes. And when you increase the evolutionary distance between genomes we're comparing, let's say this is genus level, then the number of accessory genes will start to increase first. Uh, uh, with a decreasing core, but then uh, as you increase the distance, the associations between genes at sequence level will drop down so much at some point, you will have everything as singletons. Therefore, again, uh, the fraction of the genome you will be using in pangenomics to infer associations between genomes will uh, dramatically decrease, not because the increased amount of core genes, which would have been the case here, but the uh, uh, tremendous amount of singletons that don't fit together because genomes are very distant from each other. So just to um, uh, uh, put this in a different perspective, when we think about how we go from this information to this information where we uh, have an understanding of how genomes relate to one another, uh, we, in phylogenetics, this is basically a, uh, a uh, talking about exactly what Mike talked about, we have a bunch of genes that are homologous to each other and conserved and uh, present in all genomes we're interested in. And then we align them and then we compute a tree from them. And then this is how, uh, this is one of the ways to infer the associations. In phylogenomics, in contrast, we have these multiple genes that are uh, functionally homologous and then we align them uh, separately and create a concatenated, concatenated alignment and then compute this tree. In pangenomics, however, we're, what we're doing is essentially very different compared to these, these two strategies, because we first compute a pangenome to identify those that are occurring as accessory uh, genes that have nothing to do with, uh, uh, with core genes. So all the genes that are, for instance, relevant to phylogenomics become irrelevant to, um, uh, to pangenomics in most cases. And then we compute a dendrogram. So all these strategies give you a, an understanding of how your genomes relate to one another. But as you can see already, uh, the differences between these approaches will give you different answers when you're interested in uh, understanding why this organization of genomes emerges. And combining these approaches is in fact um, not, not, not difficult at all because uh, the, uh, the, these dendrograms or, or, or trees that emerge from different approaches can easily be linked to this context or vice versa. For instance, here's an example uh, from Carl Yeoman's group in Montana. Uh, this is a pan genome of multiple uh, organisms, uh, genomes of which are here. And uh, it combines, for instance, reference genomes with uh, metagenome assembled genomes and so on. And uh, from this phylogenomic, uh, I'm sorry, from this pangenomic analysis, Yeoman uh, et al. identifies a set of single copy core genes that are shared across all these uh, uh, genomes and then computes a phylogenomic tree and adds it here. So now, for instance, this approach enables you to ask a very specific question. The, the phylogenomic tree that is supposed to tell us about evolutionary relations between these genomes agree with, uh, with the pan genome and the distribution of exterior genes. And from, from this particular uh, display, you, 
you, you can see that there's a large degree of agreement, but then the question becomes, what are those things that don't agree? And um, what can we learn more from them, for instance? And uh, in a similar fashion, this is another uh, visualization of, of all these concepts we had been talking about. This is a phylogenomic tree coming from uh, the, the genes Mike mentioned that are uh, conserved and commonly relied upon that we know them uh, through their uh, HMMs and, and so on. So all the ribosomal proteins organize these genomes this way. And this is how the pan genome um, looks like given that organization of these genomes. And here, for instance, also the information from metagenomes that indicates that these different clades of this set of genomes, in fact, also uh, um, uh, communicate uh, us how their ecology differ from each other. So this, for instance, brings together uh, ecological insights, evolutionary insights, insights from the gene pool through pangenomics, and how they all fit together uh, to discuss uh, things that don't fit uh, uh, into this, uh, um, uh, into any of these uh, insights. Um, for instance, things that don't fit together could be gene clusters that are shared between organisms that are evolutionarily very distinct according to phylogenomic analysis um, uh, and so on. So what I'm trying to tell you is that these um, approaches are linked to each other in a very inherent way and they are quite accessible. There are so many tools out there that we can discuss more about during our discussion uh, to link them together, to um, bring in the discussions we had about metagenomics, metagenomic weed recruitment, and how can we generate a holistic understanding of our organism, of the organism that we're interested in, given the environments we care about and so on. So I think this is a good point uh, to stop and start our discussion session because this is our last week. Uh, I also want to say a couple of words about what we could do going forward. And, uh, uh, and uh, also I will ask you to um, keep an eye on your emails to respond to a survey request. But before all that, I, I am very thankful for Mike's time and his effort to put this together um, uh, and his help uh, with today's uh, session. And I thank you very much for your participation and interest in this uh, uh, series. Uh, it's been now six weeks. Uh, we are still more than 180 people. It's, uh, I think it's, it's a very uh, uh, impressive turnout. So I thank you very much for that. And uh, I thank my group and, our, uh, and those, of, uh, th uh, those agencies who had been supporting our research. And I am going to stop here and uh, we will talk a little more about what's next altogether. <laughs>